Hi again, everybody. I'm Pat O'Brien. Welcome to Baseball 92. And between this show and our two national games coming up, we've got a triple cast of our own, and this one doesn't cost us. Cost us. Anyways, we get right to work here. Wouldn't you know, it's a big story here in New York area. The boss is back. Kind of in Man, I'm just tired and bored with my sin. Hey, baby. Actually, the other boss, the principal owner of the New York Yankees, was reinstated with full control yesterday, effective March 1st, 1993. George M. Steinbrenner, currently in Barcelona on business, was also born in the USA. Baseball Commissioner Faye Vincent has also been busy this week on another front. His office is preparing to appeal a federal judge's ruling in Chicago this week that prevents the commissioner from moving forward with his controversial plan to realign the National League. Meantime, the league has drawn up five different schedules and has until Saturday to submit one of them to the Players Association for its review and approval. One of the teams waiting to find out whether they'll be in the East or in the West is the Atlanta Braves, who this week moved north into first place. Last night, Atlanta made it a dozen straight wins. 12 in a row, Terry Pendleton's check swing, opposite field single in the fifth, drove in Je uh, Jeff Treadway to make it four to one. And the Braves held on for a four to three win. Tommy Glavin became the National League's first 15 game winner. And by the way, we'll hear from Neon Dion Sanders a little later on here on Baseball 92. Checking the current standings in the National League West, the Braves win, coupled with the Cincinnati's fourth straight loss, gives Atlanta a two-game lead. Meantime, in NL East, the Pirates lost and wins by the Mets and Expos also has tightened up that race over in the East. And over in the American League last night at Fenway, the Twins and Red Sox split a pair. Roger Clemens gave up only two earned runs in seven innings, but was tagged with the loss. And Roger joins us now live from Fenway. And uh, Roger, uh, welcome to Baseball 92. Thank you. Earlier this week, uh, manager Butch Hobson uh, expressed his displeasure with some sloppy play by the Red Sox, uh, the kind of play that hurt you again last night. Uh, what was your reaction to that, and what's your reaction to how your team is playing these days? Well, right now, obviously, we're not playing uh, good baseball uh, in all facets of the game right now, so I think that's where, uh, you know, Butch gets us ready to play and uh, to uh, perform to our capability. We're not, we're not doing that right now, and it's, it's very frustrating. But there's a long way to go, and we've just got to keep uh, keep on uh, getting down the road. You know, we can't give up, and, and it's frustrating. But, you know, like I said, we just got to keep plugging away, and we've got to play uh, good defensively so we don't embarrass ourselves. Hey, Rocket, speaking of frustrations, last Saturday you had some choice words of your own for Boston Herald uh, sports writer George Kimball, who had written in an earlier column that you allegedly ignored the autograph request of a grandmother in spring training. It turned out that she wanted it for her grandson who had Down syndrome. Uh, this is what you told Kimball, as if you need to be reminded. This is what you told him in the locker room. Until he leaves, and I'll be more than happy to talk to all y'all. I'm not saying a word until he leaves. The lowest, that's the lowest blow. I've been here eight and a half years. That's the lowest blow I've ever had since I've been here. I can take criticism on the field, but you're a horse You're a horse Take off. You're a horse Low life, and it's obvious the way you take care of yourself. Take a hike. To death. Out here. I'm not talking. I'll be more than happy to accommodate these people, but that's a low blow, and you know it. Hope you can sleep at night. Frustrating, I know, because you do a lot of charity work in the Boston area and do sign a lot of autographs, but how low do you think that blow was, and, and why did you lose your temper like that? Well, uh, like I said, I, it's behind me now, so I'm not too concerned with it. I said what needed to be said to, to that man, if you can call it that, but uh, I'm just disappointed. You know, he wrote the story and took off on vacation, didn't show up until then, and uh, didn't come to me to ask me anything about it. I think I do my, my fair share in the public and everything, but it's over with, and uh, a few southern adjectives towards towards that person and uh, try to take care of it the best way I knew how and uh, and hit him head on with it. So it's over with now, and we're going to look forward. Put it behind you. Wish you would have handled it a little differently, perhaps? Oh, not at all. Uh, like I said, uh, I would hope that if anyone would uh, blame me or insinuate that a person didn't get an autograph or something of that nature to a kid that's got Down syndrome or sick or at the children's hospital here. There's not any athlete that's on this earth that would not take time out to do that and and uh, take care of a kid that's uh, deprived of that situation. I'd like to say one other thing, if I may. Um, all of our hearts here with the Boston Red Sox and, and all these guys on the team, um, our heart goes out to Tim Hewlett there in Baltimore. Um, 
that's just that's just devastating and our hearts go out to him and his family roger thanks for being on and we share that with uh, you too of course tim hewlett's six-year-old son was killed in a tragic uh, auto accident and uh, roger uh, with the big heart and the big arm uh, roger clemens thanks for joining us on baseball 92. okay gang See ya. we come back here uh, we'll talk with two men who have uh, some big choices to make greg maddox of the cubs and neon Dion sanders of the braves or will it be the falcons stay tuned as baseball 92 rolls on from yawkey place to harbor place to your place here at our place stay with us sanders becomes the busiest man in sports try to remember the kind of september he had last year and he won some personal hustle awards for leaving football practice for the falcons to dash off and join the braves in the heat of their dramatic pennant race Pretty exciting. Dion joins us from his own hair salon outside of Atlanta. Dion's Hair Design. And we go inside, and there's the man. Thanks for joining us, Dion. By the way, how you feeling? I'm feeling all right. I'm a little partly cloudy. I'm having a little flu bug or some kind of bug right now. Well, it's, your team certainly is feeling pretty good. You've uh, won 12 in a row now. What's going on there? All the pieces seem to be fitting. Well, I don't think it's us. I think it's those guys on the mound. They're pitching. They're doing a tremendous job day after day. You know, our, our four starters, and we have really have five in the rotation. They're doing tremendous. Dan, what are you going to do personally? Play football and baseball? Play only football, only baseball? What's going to go on there? I'm going to always continue to play both sports. But the question is, is which sport gets the priority? That's baseball full-time or football full-time. And the Braves know that I express much interest in playing baseball full-time. Winnie, are you going to give up the Braves? Which one takes priority right now? What's that? Which one takes priority right now? Which sport takes priority? Right now, it's the Braves because we're winning. We're doing a heck of a job. You know, I hate to leave a winning team, and I'm a part of that success. I really feel like this year I'm contributing to Braves' success. In the back of your mind, don't you feel that perhaps you're closer to winning a championship? You know, everybody frames their career on winning a championship. Uh, the Braves a better shot at winning a championship than the Falcons, although Atlanta's a good team. You, you really do, but you have to take into consideration I'm platooning also with Otis Nixon, and he's doing a heck of a job. You know, it wouldn't even be a question in the back of my mind if I was in there full time and playing every day. But when you're platooning, it's, it's, a, lot, it's a lot different. Well, the way it looks now, Atlanta's going to be, the Braves are going to be in the race. What are you going to do then? It's no talent. I can't look into the future. I can only take care of Dave. Dion, you're trying to tell me you haven't thought about this? <laughs> Come on. You've thought I, I'm about serious. this. I haven't. You know, you guys may think I'm crazy, but to tell the truth, I really don't care. I'm going to play football or baseball, and I'm going to play both, and I don't know which one's going to get the priority. I really don't care because I love my teammates in football. I love my teammates in baseball, and I'm going to be happy. Is money, a, uh, will money make a difference here? Is it the buck? But, well, you, you could say that, but then again, you, you couldn't. You know, it's just which one who really needs you the most. It, it really doesn't matter to me, to tell you the truth. Uh, you going to get your hair cut today? Maybe I might get my nails done. Hair today, <laughs> gone tomorrow, huh? Dion, yeah. thanks, <laughs> thanks for joining us. We'll see you down the road. Okay. And tough as nails, too. Speaking of money, we wondered if someone came up to you and offered you $28 million to play a kid's game for the next five years, what would you say? Well, Greg Maddox said no. And that's because there's really no one outside of Roger Clemens who has put up numbers like Greg Maddox has in the last four years. And now at age 26, he stands poised to become the youngest free agent pitcher and perhaps soon the wealthiest. And uh, Greg joins us live now from our affiliate in Houston, Texas. Uh, Greg, welcome, and uh, welcome to base Baseball 92. How you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. Why did you turn down $28 million? Well, there, there are a number of reasons. Uh, the biggest one is uh, last winter, uh, we had a lot of problems. Uh, I wanted to get it done last December and things just didn't work out. Uh, you know, I let it, I let it know that, that I wanted it done before the season started. I wanted to settle down in Chicago, find a place to live. And they, it just didn't get worked out in December. And I don't think right now is the time to talk about contracts. Uh, I have a hard enough time 
getting hitters out, and uh, this just makes it a little bit tougher. Yeah, considering the uh, mega deal that they gave Ryan Sandberg, the $7 million a year man, do you feel that he was given preferential treatment? Did that factor into it? I think he deserved it, to tell you the truth. Uh, you know, Rhino's been there a lot longer than I have. Uh, he means a lot to uh, the Cubs, and uh, I'm happy for Rhino. Yeah. How much will it take to sign you with the Cubs, or to sign you? How much money do you think you're worth? I don't, I don't really know. Uh, there's kind of a different... Obviously a difference. more than $28 million, you feel, right? There's a difference in opinion on, on what the market's going to be. Uh, I don't want to sell myself short, but on the other hand, I want to be happy. And I am happy in Chicago. I love the city. The fans are great. Uh, I've met a lot of nice friends there. And I don't really want to leave, but I also don't want to sell myself short also. Yeah. Are there any other teams that, that, that you would like, like the Yankees would love to have you, I'm sure the Dodgers would love to have you, any other clubs on your shopping list? Well, I haven't thought too much about that. Uh, I do live in Las Vegas, so uh, uh, I don't live in a major league city, so I really can't say I have a home, a home team. Right. Do you, do you, are you afraid at all of a risk of not getting this deal done and perhaps, you know, God forbid, injuring yourself, uh, throwing out the arm or something and not having, the, let's say, the $28 million on the table? Well, I have thought about that. I have, I have insurance for that right now. If uh, I never pitch another game, I have insurance for that. So money's not a factor. All right, Greg, thanks for joining us. By the way, if you sign this new deal, you'll have a lot of new friends, wherever you go, okay? <laughs> thanks for joining us, Greg. Good luck to you. Uh, next up, we'll meet the uh, starting lineup of our Baseball 92 Dream Team, an idea from out of left field as we continue in a moment. Stay with us. Old Cape Cod, it is known affectionately as the Green Monster. It is the 37-foot-tall left field wall at Fenway Park. And in its honor, we'll call our new feature segment Left Field. And so from those out-of-control folks who brought you the At the Half Gazette and around the NFL today, here now the latest from Out of Left Field. you wanted to see isn't it another story on the dream team but we're going to give it some magic spin and put a different hook on it because this is our dream team even better than an all-star team because we've taken the liberty to put american and national league players on the same field of dreams So as you scan the lineup, whether you're a rotisserie freak or one of those Cuban sluggers in Barcelona, I bet you wish you could wake up and be part of our dream. I guess it's an honor. But what, what does this entail? Does this mean at the end of the World Series we get to take a trip somewhere and play some other dream team out of some other country? Does that mean we go to the Olympics? To play basketball, you mean? No, baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Those Beantown baseballs are na 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 not going back 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 like they used to. You see, in 1988, Fenway added an aerodynamically questionable addition, and the answer, my friends, is blowing in the wind. We get over that building what's called the vortex, which is simply a, a very big swirl in the air. Now the wind goes up, comes down, and then back towards home plate. So something that in the past would just have made center field is now going to fall 8 to 12 feet short, which means it's caught on the warning track. Got it. Left field is full of wonders, including the eighth wonder of the world, the Houston Astrodome, alleged home of the Astros, who are about to embark on the mother of all road trips. This mother will be 26 games in 28 days. And if you think that's Bush, they were disowned this week, even as they were packing. You see, the grand old party will be moving in for its convention. And yes, Ross Perot won't be the only Texan looking for some time off this summer. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Better, better fact that I'll get a chance to be off in the middle of the summer. And if you think we catch everything in left, you're right. Right now, it's time to send you out to the uh, ballparks. I'm Pat O'Brien in New York. I'll be here with scores and updates throughout the day. Have a nice Saturday. Enjoy the game, everybody. Welcome, everyone, to the Baltimore Orioles spectacular new ballpark, Oriole Park at Camden Yards. 
nestled comfortably in downtown Baltimore. It is a splendid setting in which to enjoy an afternoon of baseball. Thank you. Thank you. So come inside and join the 28th consecutive sellout here as CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today it's game three of a four-game series between the Texas Rangers and the Baltimore Orioles. The Orioles beat the Rangers last night to even the series at one win apiece, and in the process, the Orioles gained a game on first place Toronto. They're now four games out, while the Rangers are slipping back in the West. They now trail Minnesota by eight and a half. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this fabulous ballpark. I'm Sean McDonough, along with Tim McCarver, and it's great to have you with us for a battle between two teams trying to remain in contention in their respective divisions. And Tim, lately they've been trying to do that without a contribution from their big gun. Without uh, their big run producers, they have really been struggling. The top dog for Texas is Ruben Sierra. He's three for 33, a point to 90 batting average with no RBI since the All-Star break. And Cal Ripken Jr. in one of the worst slumps of his career. He's 10 for his last 83 over his last 21 ball games. I think you got to keep in mind that uh, to compensate for the lack of hitting, the Orioles have good pitching. Texas Rangers can't compensate in that, re in that regard. As a matter of fact, manager John Oates of the Baltimore Orioles told us this morning that he thinks the key for his team to stay in the race is to continue to get quality pitching from the young starters, Messina, McDonald, and Rose. Today, it's a veteran starter on the mound for Baltimore, 36-year-old right-hander Rick Sutcliffe, looking for his 11th win of the year. He'll be opposed by the Rangers' hard-throwing right-hander, Bobby Witt. And we'll have the first pitch of the ball game for you from Baltimore in just a moment. CBS Sports presents Major League Baseball. Today's game is brought to you by Toyota, reminding you to always buckle up. Do it for those who love you. Rolaid. Rolaid spells 100% relief. And by Pinnacle, by score. Serious cards for a serious game. Oriole Park at Camden Yards in Baltimore where this afternoon the Orioles' Cal Ripken is about to start consecutive game number 1,670. He's yawning and there are some <laughs> who think here in Baltimore that slump that we talked about is a result of fatigue. And trying to chase Lou Gehrig's 2,130 games played. Let's take a look at Cal Ripken through a three-month period. Here he is in early June and look at the bat angle. It's up. It is flat here in late June and even flatter and he's got that squat right there even more of a crouch and uh, and that was on thursday night and i think what that usually denotes is fatigue when that bat is up you appear to be stronger and when the bat flattens out you you appear to be a little more tired and that appears to be the case with cal ripken jr right now but of course that a case could be made for that over the last ten and a half years. That's when he started that remarkable streak of 1,630 games in a row play. Rickon had two hits last night, but as you saw, he's hit only 120 over the last 21 games, and he's yawning again. Rick Sutcliffe, he might be a little bit tired as he takes the mound, working today on three days rest. And the lineup he will face this afternoon for the Texas Rangers, Brian Downing leads off as the DH. Jeff Hewson at shortstop. Rafael Palmero at first base. The cleanup hitter is right fielder Ruben Sierra. Kevin Reimer bats fifth in left field. Juan Gonzalez, the center fielder. Batting seventh, the third baseman Dean Palmer. The catcher is Gino Petrali batting eighth. And batting ninth, the rookie second baseman Jeff Fry. Sean, you mentioned uh, Rick Sutcliffe and is starting on three days rest. Earlier this year, he started against the Cleveland Indians on only two days rest, and he won that ball game. And he hasn't changed in the last 13 years. A lot of deep counts. He gets ahead with strikes and tries to get them out on balls. The defense of behind Rick Sutcliffe, Brady Anderson, will be in left field. Talented Mike Devereaux, the center fielder. Joe Orsalak, the ex-Pittsburgh Pirate in right field. Leo Gomez, the third baseman. Cal Ripken Jr. at shortstop and his brother Billy Ripken at second base. Randy Milligan will be the first baseman. And Jeff Tackett, who is in for the injured Chris Hoyles. Talking to Johnny Oates today before the game and Johnny said that Chris Hoyles should be out more than two more weeks because they found movement in that bone yesterday. It was broken back on June 21st by Tim Leary. 
We are ready to go as Brian Downing digs in. He's hitting 251 with eight homers and 20 runs driven in. The 41 year old Downing facing 36 year old Rick Sutcliffe. And the first pitch of the afternoon is a fastball to belt for a called strike. It was Gene Mock who made Brian Downing a leadoff man late in his career because of his high on base percentage. And Brian Downing says, I hate it, but I do it to exist. That's well hit to left center and into the gap. Past Brady Anderson and all the way to the wall. And Brian Downing starts this one with a double. I think one of the reasons that Brian hates it is he is a power hitter. He has eight home runs this year. And usually your power hitters hit in the fat part of the of the batting order. Brian puts the fat part of the bat on this set clip fastball and hammers one to left center to open the game for the Rangers. Now Jeff Houston, who has been platooning at shortstop with Dickie Thon since Toby Harris took over as the Texas manager. Houston enjoying his finest season in the majors. Which hitter batting 271 overall? He bunts toward third. Leo Gomez throws him out. The Rangers playing for one run here in the first inning as Houston sacrifices Downing to third with one out. I believe I said Houston is a switch hitter. He is not strictly a left-handed hitter batting 271 for the season. The batter is Rafael Palmero hitting 272. Now that average has come a long way up. One month ago on this date in June, he was hitting 245. The Oriole infield back here in the first inning. And Sutcliffe misses down and in to Palmero. One surprising thing about Rafael Palmero, uh, a lot of National League people who saw him hit with the Chicago Cubs never thought that he could become a power hitter. But he has come, uh, he has become a bona fide power hitter. 11 home runs this year, 27 last year, close to 100 RBIs. That's the short. Ripken snares it behind second and throws him out. That gets the run in. Downing scores to make it one nothing Texas. And the RBI for Rafael Palmero is his 51st of the year. A lot of people say, well, so what? Cal Ripken may be a little tired, but look at all of the other areas that he can help you. Two years ago, he set a major league record with only three errors. Can you imagine that? 162 games and you make three errors in uh, the very, very pivotal position of shortstop. He won the gold glove last year, was the MVP in the American League, and played in every game, of course. You didn't hear about fatigue this no. time of year last year, but you are now that he is struggling. Ruben Sierra slumping, as you saw at the beginning of the telecast. Routine fly to shallow left for Brady Anderson. So the Rangers capitalize on the leadoff double by Brian Downing. They score a run, and after half an inning, it's the Rangers one and the Orioles coming up. Off double by Brian Downing. One nothing Texas as the Orioles get ready to come up for the first time uh, against Canton, Massachusetts native Bobby Witt. High fastballs and a wicked slider from Bobby Witt. It's just a matter of whether he can throw strikes or not. You mentioned the slider in a recent poll conducted of American League managers. By Baseball America magazine, he is the third best slider in the league behind Roger Clemens and Jim Abbott. Brady Anderson leads off for the Orioles this afternoon. Mike Devereaux in center field, bat second. Cal Ripken, the shortstop, hitting third. Glenn Davis, the cleanup hitter, and D.H. Randy Milligan at first base. Batting sixth in right field, Joe Orsalak. Leo Gomez, the third baseman, hits seventh. Bill Ripken is the second baseman, and batting ninth, the catcher, Jeff Tackett. A 
supporting role for Bobby Witt. Kevin Reimer will be in left field. He's made more errors than any other Major League outfielder. He has eight. He is not a good fielder, but a fine hitter. Juan Gonzalez in center field. Ruben Sierra in right field. Dean Palmer, the third baseman. Jeff Houston is at shortstop. Young Jeff Fry, only his 12th start this year at second base. Rafael Palmero at first base. And Gino Petralli in as the catcher. Yvonne Rodriguez hurt by Glenn Davis in last night's ballgame. And Brady Anderson leads off. He continues to enjoy what is far and away his best season in Major League Baseball. Bobby Witt's first pitch, a ball low. Anderson hitting 287 with 15 homers. That leads the team, and 60 runs batted in is also the club high, and that's coming from a man who has been the leadoff hitter all year. Far and away, huh? It's almost like Ronnie Howard has produced this year <laughs> for Brady Anderson. <laughs> he came into this season a lifetime 219 hitter at the major league level. He had not hit higher than 231 in any of the previous four seasons. And that's a major league record for lowest batting average over four years to start the career with 60 games or more played in the outfield. Jeff Fry, the catch of the pop-up in shallow right. This is what Sean was talking about. Look at it from 1988 to 1991. Never over 231. He had only 10 home runs in that four-year span and already... And a little more than 100 games, he has 15 home runs, 60 RBI. So that is indeed far and away his best year. And Mike Devereaux is joining him with an outstanding year in the outfield for the Orioles. Wits in with strike one to him. Toby Hera has managed 13 games since taking over for Bobby Valentine. The Royals are 6-7. and seven. The Rangers, rather, are 6-7. and seven. That's down the left field line and caught by Reimer. Two outs. And striding to the plate, Cal Ripken. With his two hits last night, he got his average back up to 252. He is at 10 out of the park and knocked in 46. Talked about that bat angle now. Let's see if Ripken can keep his hands up. As we said in the opening, that's usually the sign that a hitter is tired when he drops the barrel of the bat because he's got so much to do to get it back in that hitting position. See how low it is right there? Pitch is low as well. One ball on Ripton in the bottom of the first. One nothing. Texas. There it is right there. You see the slant of the Ripken bat once again. It's slanted downward. And you really have a lot to do with your hands to get those hands back up in a hitting position. One and one now on Ripken. He doubled last night. It was his first extra base hit in 23 games. high two and one we saw the graphic at the beginning of the telecast over the last 21 games Ripken has hit 120 but prior to last night over the 20 ball games he had hit just 101 the worst span of his career over a 20 game stretch there's the nifty slider that we spoke of from Witt. Only Roger Clemens and Jim Abbott, in the opinion of American League managers, have a better slider than Bobby Witt. And the count is full at three and two. Not only is Cal slumping at the plate, he's also had his problems lately in the field. He's committed two errors in the last four games. And the 
breaking ball misses. The Orioles have their first base runner. With two outs in the bottom of the first. And with Texas leading one to nothing. Walks are not unusual for Bobby Witt. However, during his last start, or in his last start last Monday against the Milwaukee Brewers, he went seven and a third innings and walked no one. That is the longest he has ever gone in a major league start without walking anybody going seven and a third innings. That's in 175 starts. So he has really had a problem throughout his career finding the strike zone. Glenn Davis, the batter, and he is enjoying his best stretch as a member of the Orioles, and that isn't saying much because he has seen very limited duty in a year and a half due to injury. Davis comes into this one having hit an eight straight, his longest hit streak in a Baltimore uniform. He's reached base in 23 straight games. Pitch in the dirt, blocked by Petrali. 2-0 and on Davis with Ripken at first and two outs. You can make a point of reference uh, and uh, Cal Ripken's flat bat or the bat that pointed to the ground and look at the location of the hands of Glenn Davis and how set he is. Davis says he's gone back to many of the fundamental things in his swing that worked for him when he was a member of the Houston Astros. Including the position of the hands. That's sinking fast and left. Reimer blocked it on a hop. Ripken will be held at third. It's a long single for Glenn Davis. He's now hit a nine straight, and the Orioles have first and third with two outs in the bottom of the first. Kevin Reimer, we talked about the problems he has had in the field, but in fairness to Kevin on this play, a lot of left fielders would have had problems with that ball. Matter of fact, Reimer does a good job to smother the ball, keep it to his left. Had it gotten by him, Ripken perhaps would have scored. Now Randy Milligan. His average has dipped to 249. Seems like on these two teams, you're either very hot at the moment or very cold, and Milligan has been cold. That's out of play and right. The man they call Moose here in Baltimore, Randy Milligan, has hit just 188 over his last 32 games. So this is a guy who has always had a high on-base percentage. He walks a lot, and he's been doing that during this slump in the 32 games in which he has not hit much. He's walked 28 times. One ball and one strike on Randy Milligan. And a strike, one and two. Yeah, there are some folks around that think that Randy is too passive at the plate. He takes a lot of balls and walks a lot, but he also takes a lot of strikes, too. So often the two out walk hurts with hoping that the two out free pass to Ripken doesn't harm him here in the first. Davis followed it with a single first and third with two outs. One nothing Texas in the first Milligan with a fly ball to right and a routine play for Sierra that ends the inning. After one in Baltimore it's the Rangers one and the Orioles nothing. Sean McDonough with Tim McCarver. At Oriole Park in Baltimore, the Rangers lead one to nothing after an inning, and Kevin Reimer leads off. He's hitting 289. 11 homers and 43 knocked in. He'll be followed by Juan Gonzalez and Dean Palmer against Rick Sutcliffe. Reimer's name has been mentioned in recent days in trade rumors. The Rangers in the market for a pitcher, Toby Hara said yesterday he felt the Rangers would make a move or two when they got home off this road trip to try to shore themselves up for the stretch run. And Reimer's the kind of guy with a bat who might be attractive to another contending team. Really a case in perseverance. 604 games in the minor leagues before finally getting a shot a couple of years ago. He can hit. A lot of power. 
And that unusual style of picking up that right foot. You see a lot of Rangers doing that. They are high steppers. High steppers from Texas. <laughs> two and two now on Reimer. Rick Sutcliffe has tried five times to win victory number 150. He's been stuck on 149 for the last three weeks. With Reimer at the plate, the third baseman Gomez is way off the line. And the outfield plays him to pull as well. Sutcliffe. Tim Meshin will go deep into a lot of counts, and he just walked Reimer on a 3-2 pitch. So the Rangers have the lead man on for the second straight inning. That's the first walk thrown by Sutcliffe. He's been looking for career win number 150. He has 10 wins this year, and last year the Orioles had only one 10-game winner. Bob Malacki, who's back in the minors with AAA Rochester, trying to get himself on track. Here's Juan Gonzalez. At 255, 20 homers, 59 knocked in. Gonzalez with 20 round trippers is tied for fourth in the American League. Talking about set clip in that uh, 150 win plateau. He was rookie of the year in 1979. There have been 23 pitchers who have won a rookie of the year award. 23. And only one of them has won more than 150 games. Tom Seaver won 311. Hmm. So if Sutcliffe wins his 150th, and he eventually will, and he will be only the second pitcher to have a Rookie of the Year award and win 150 or more games. And you'd have to think in this league that Dave Fleming, the pitcher from Seattle, has a chance to be the Rookie of the Year. And win 150 games uh -huh. the way he's pitching. Not all this year, but eventually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Reimer at first with nobody out. In the second, the Rangers lead one to nothing. The one-two pitch swung on and missed. That's been the problem lately for Gonzalez. He has chased a lot of balls out of the strike zone. It's the first out of the inning and the first strikeout of the day for Sutcliffe. And remember what we said earlier. Sutcliffe gets ahead with strikes and gets them out with balls. And that's an example of how he pitches when he's ahead in the count. With one out, the batter is Dean Palmer. He is 0 for his last 18. As we mentioned, in this game, either you are hot or you're not. Gonzalez with the strikeout, now 4 for his last 37. Palmer 0 for 18, 2 for his last 30. Sutcliffe missed just low. Storm Davis was originally scheduled to start today. But as Tim mentioned, Rick Sutcliffe didn't throw many pitches in his last start, just 103, which is a low total by his standards. And Mike Messina, in a rain-shortened outing earlier this week against Chicago, threw just 59 pitches, so he's ready to come back tomorrow on short rest. Storm Davis was bypassed. Davis has had trouble in his career against the Texas Rangers, and they also need to shore up the bullpen a bit as Alan Mills has thrown a lot of innings out there, and he's tired. Messina will be starting against another young fellow tomorrow afternoon, right? Mm hmm <laughs> Nolan Ryan. In on the hands and fouled straight back. One and two on Dean Palmer, who leads the league in strikeouts. He has fanned exactly 100 times. Leads all of Major League Baseball in that area. But he's also second among all Major League third basemen in home runs with his 16. Two behind San Diego's Gary Sheffield. So it's safe to say that this is the appropriate park to be either a penthouse or a warehouse. They have them both here. <laughs> a lot of penthouses here at uh, this beautiful ballpark. It's my first trip here this year, Sean, and I'll tell you, they made no mistakes with this park. 
strike three. Palmer strikes up. For the 101st time this year, back-to-back -back strikeouts for Sutcliffe. There's the B&O Warehouse that is one of the prominent features of this park. Across Utah Street out in right field. It's the longest building east of the Mississippi. So many wonderful features about this park that we'll tell you about as the afternoon goes along. They're building a new park in Arlington, Texas, and some of the ideas for the new home of the Rangers have been borrowed from Oriole Park at Camden Yards. You can understand why when you see this park. It is something. Gino Petrali takes a looping breaking ball for a strike. He's in there, as Tim mentioned, because of the injury last night suffered by Yvonne Rodriguez, the all-star 20-year-old catcher of the Rangers. That's chopped foul. Rodriguez injured on a collision at home plate with Glenn Davis. Glenn Davis was on second base with two outs last night. The ball off the glove of young Jeff Fry. Fry hurriedly gets it home, and you see Glenn Davis going in high above the shin guard of Yvonne Rodriguez. Rodriguez. A lot of catchers consider that out of bounds. Anything below the shin guard is fine, but when you get above that shin guard, uh, then obviously that's flesh in there, and there was a gash on the left thigh of Yvonne Rodriguez, and plus it is uh, bruised. His status day to day, it may or may not be coincidental that after that collision at home plate, three Baltimore batters were hit by pitches. We asked Johnny Oates about that before the game. He said he didn't know if it was intentional or not on the part of the Texas pitchers. But a lot of the Rangers apparently felt that that was not a play within the bounds of baseball as it should be played. If you're sliding into a catcher, I mean, if he's blocking the plate, uh, you certainly have every right to either bowl him over or go into him with a straight, stiff leg. But uh, the rule of thumb, or the rule of uh, shin guard, I guess, in this uh, particular instance, is to stay below the shin guard. But uh, Glenn Davis jumping, more or less, into the left thigh of Yvonne Rodriguez, and a lot of the Rangers uh, unsettled because of that. Rodriguez with the gash that Tim mentioned and a strained ligament in his left knee, expected to be sidelined for a few days. They've recalled catcher Ray Stevens from the minors to back up the trolley. And Gino walks on a 3-2 pitch. So Sutcliffe started the inning by walking Reimer on a 3-2 pitch. Then he struck out Gonzalez and Palmer. Now the second walk of the inning issued to Petrali, and here's the number nine hitter. Rookie second baseman Jeff Fry, who was the leadoff hitter last night and started the ball game with his first major league home run off Arthur Rhodes. 30th round draft choice. Born in Oakland, actually grew up in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Shortstop in Las Vegas, as you saw. So he went from Oki to Oki, I guess. 5'5", <laughs> 135 pounds when he graduated from high school. So he is indeed a small fry. Huh? Mm. And I don't think much bigger than that 5'5", 135 pounds. The no. <laughs> Ranger PR people list him at 5'9". And if he's 5'9", I'm Moses Malone. <laughs> You're not, and he's not. No. But he's a good player. He's one of those guys who was told throughout his professional career that he really was not considered a prospect, but at each level he made an all-star team or at least made his presence known. He progressed through the Ranger system. And here he is in the majors for the first time. And up there with a count of two balls and one strike. Runners at first and second with two outs in the second. One nothing Texas. A lot of times it's not the number of injuries a team has, but who's injured? Last year's batting champion in the American League, Julio Franco, out. He's only played nine games this season. And Jeff Fry is the fifth second baseman they've tried out there. Two and two. Away. 
base. Sutcliffe trying to strike out the side with a couple of walks mixed in. I think we can see by this inning why Sutcliffe ordinarily throws a high number of pitches in his start. Johnny Oates says that uh, Rick has gone out there sometimes in the third inning, having thrown over 50 pitches in the first two. Johnny thought the Rangers would help him along today. They are a free swinging ball club. So he thought Sutcliffe might not have to do as much work if the Rangers do swing at some of those balls out of the strike zone. But it looks like, for the most part, the mindset of the Ranger hitters to this point has been to make him throw strikes. Making him throw strikes, and that one just missed. It's three and two, and with two outs, the runners will be on the move with the next pitch. That it just missed. Let's see by how much. It was close. It looked high, however. The umpires working this ball game, Dan Morrison calling the balls and strikes. Tim Welke at first. Dale Scott at second, Rich Garcia at third. We mentioned the poll of American League managers, and they selected Rich Garcia and Tim Welke as the top two umpires in the American League. We have two of the best, in the opinion of the AL skippers, working this one, including Rich Garcia, the crew chief, working third this afternoon. Richie asked us to say hello to Steve Palermo. And we do so gladly. We're glad to hear that Steve continues to make progress coming back from the gunshot wounds. And all of us at CBS send our best to Steve as well. Fry, foul tipped it into the mid of Tackett to end the inning. And Sutcliffe strikes out the side while walking two. After an inning and a half, one nothing Rangers. This series is being played against the backdrop of extraordinary sadness here in Baltimore. On Thursday, Sam Hewlett, the six-year-old son of Orioles infielder Tim Hewlett, died as a result of head injuries suffered when he was struck by a car near the family home in suburban Baltimore on Wednesday afternoon. And the Orioles are just now starting to get their focus back into baseball it's very difficult Tim Hewlett was in the clubhouse before the game this morning to thank his teammates for their expressions of sympathy and compassion Tim Hewlett is leaving the Orioles today and heading to the family home in Springfield Illinois for the funeral services and he has been placed on the disabled list Johnny Oates said they'll give him as much time as he needs he thinks Hewlett will return to the Orioles a week from Thursday and all of us at CBS send our condolences to Tim Hewlett, his wife Linda, and their three sons. Joe Orsalak, the batter, as we go to the bottom of the second. It's 1 0 Texas. He's facing Bobby Witt. Cold foul past Davy Lopes in the first base coach's box. The tragedy involving Sam Hewlett certainly places this game in its proper perspective. Yeah, it really does. The Orioles already a closely knit team, but Johnny Oates feels that this has brought them even closer together as they have shared their concerns with each other, their anguish. Juan Gonzalez, the catch of the fly ball into shallow center. John Oates thought that his team's attention to the ball game was a lot better last night than it had been on Thursday night when they lost the first game of the series to the Rangers. You could sense that in the stadium as well. Leo Gomez, the 282, eight homers, and his power is starting to come on lately, and 42 runs driven in. Witt starts him with a strike. To replace Tim Hewlett on the active roster, Tommy Shields, an infielder, has been called up from AAA Rochester. 
Went right down the middle with strike two. Mention the production numbers of Gomez have been on the rise. Over the last 10 games, he's hit three three-run homers, and he's perfect in limited duty lifetime against Bobby Witt. Three-run homers. If Earl Weaver's listening, he'd love that. Earl Weaver, the former manager of the Baltimore Orioles, and what a winner he was. That's how he uh, thought offenses should be run. On defense, you have tight pitching, tight infield defense, especially up the middle, and a good center fielder. And on offense, a three-run homer. as chewing the bunt on more than one occasion. Down the left field line, it hooks foul. He was asked once, was Earl Weaver, about chemistry on a ball club. Then he went to the blackboard and wrote 3RH plus GPG <laughs> equals W. Somebody said, what does that have to do with team chemistry? He said, the only chemistry I'm worried about is three run homers plus good pitched games equals a win. <laughs> that was his formula. Jeff Hewson throws out Gomez. Two down in the Baltimore second. The Rangers lead one to nothing. They scored a run in the top of the first. Brian Downing started the game with a double. He was sacrificed to third by Jeff Houston and scored on a ground out by Rafael Palmero. Now the number eight hitter, Bill Ripken. He checks in at 236 with three homers and 19 driven in. The Orioles have gotten extraordinary production out of their eight and nine holes. Their eight and nine batters with 93 RBIs on the year and 17 home runs. Unbelievable. Mm. And a nice play by Witt on the comebacker to get Bill Ripken and end the inning. One, two, three, go the Orioles in the second. And after two, it's one nothing, Texas. Managers hope that their teams aren't bad enough to where they have to use that stuff. <laughs> Not a lot of Broma Seltzer for John Oates this year. Brian Downing out on the bounding ball down to third. One out in the third. As Gomez threw out Downing, who doubled the lead off the ball game, and Brian scored the only run in the game to this point. John Oates starting to get his due as a fine Major League Manager. We've referred already several times to the Baseball America poll of American League managers, and by his peers, John Oates was selected as the third best manager in the league. And when you look at the company he's with, Tom Kelly of the Twins was selected first, and Tony La Russa of Oakland second. They are always regarded among the best managers in baseball. John Oates is right there with them. Quickly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jeff Houston, the batter, he sacrificed against Rick Sutcliffe in the first. hit to right. Borsalak on the warning track makes the catch. And quickly there are two away in the Ranger third. Texas batting with a 1-0 lead. In a new ballpark, there are two things that hitters look for in a new ballpark. They, you know, the seating arrangement is nice for fans and all that, but the backdrop in center field right there, that's the number one thing they look for. They want to see the ball well. The second thing they look for, down the lines. It's 318 down the right field line here and 333 down the left field line. So this ballpark favoring left-handed batters. The pitchers, uh, incidentally, the first thing they look for, they look down the lines first. <laughs> and then they check the flags, number two, and see which way the wind's blowing. And if it has a propensity to blow out, they don't like it. <laughs> well, in this ballpark, you would not check the flags. You would check the Orioles at uh -huh. the top of the scoreboard in right center field. They are uh, ornithologically, whatever the word is. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. Correct, we are told. Although I don't think an Oriole is that narrow. <laughs> and those are weather vanes. Those Orioles point in the direction the wind is blowing. Very little breeze to speak of, and what breeze there is is blowing in. Says the foreign period correct bird out there on top of the scoreboard. Ornithological. Thank you. Yes. Easy for me to say. <laughs> I was still thinking about see the ball, be the ball with the background. <laughs> Rafael Palmero 
has had success against Sutcliffe in his career. And Raphael drove in the only run of this ball game with a ground out in the first. That was well hit past Sutcliffe, but right to Cal Ripken. And the Rangers go quickly in order in the third. After two and a half, one nothing, Texas. <laughs> Tim up there in Camden Yards <laughs> after this message and a word from your local station. All out on hand here at Oriole Park at Camden Yards in Baltimore. This will be the 36th sellout in all at home this season for Baltimore and the Orioles 49th home date. Jeff Tackett leads off. They're averaging more than 12,000 fans per game, more than they did last year in their final season at Memorial Stadium. Tackett looked at a ball high. He's done a fine job in filling in for Chris Hoyles, who's been out a month with a fractured left wrist. Bobby Witt has fallen behind Tackett 2-0. Oh. He'll face Tackett, Anderson, and Devereaux in the bottom of the third. Witt working with a 1-0 lead. As you saw, Tackett has five home runs this season for the Orioles. That's in only 39 games, only 110 at bats. Four of those home runs have come here at home. He's been in professional baseball, has Jeff Taggett, since 1984. And coming into this season, he had only hit a total of 12 professional home runs. That's right. He went five years from 84 through 88 without hitting one. The 2-2 two -two from Bobby Witt is low and away. As Tim mentioned, Chris Hoyles hoped to be back in about two weeks. He had been doing some tossing on the side in recent days, but he had x-rays two days ago, and they revealed that the fracture has moved around a bit, and they told him to put things on hold for four or five days. Tackett strikes out for the first out of the inning. That's the first strikeout of the afternoon for Bobby Witt, who's retired five in a row. First strikeout for Bobby Witt, but look where he ranks in most strikeouts per nine innings in Major League history. Nolan Ryan is number one with over 5,500 total. Sandy Koufax, number two, then Big Sam McDowell. Herb score was fourth. Bobby Witt is eighth. Interestingly, the Mets have two in the top eight. David Cohn is fifth, and Sid Fernandez is in seventh. Sid Fernandez pitching a complete game shutout last night against San Diego. And the Mets starting to climb quickly back into it in the National League East. Brady Anderson has hit in six straight games. He's 0 for 1 this afternoon. New York has won three in a row, 7 of 10. The Mets just four games behind Pittsburgh now. And Montreal's only three out in the National League East. Three balls and no strikes on Brady Anderson. Oh. Taking all the way, three and one. Brady Anderson uh, giving new meaning to the word or to the words, Baltimore chop. <laughs> He's got his own chop right there. Sideburns. He says he doesn't think they have anything to do with his newfound success this year, but he's not shaving them off. That's either. right. That's lined off the glove of Jeff Fry. Went right through him into shallow right center field, and Anderson is aboard with one out in the third. That was so, uh, certainly no Baltimore chop. A line drive off the glove of Jeff Fry. That ball's got to be handled. I would be surprised if it's a hit. They have uh, not scored it yet. Of course, that was not a Baltimore chop, nor a Texas leaguer either. Off the webbing. And uh, Brady Anderson is credited with a hit, and that's uh, scoring that you look for at yeah, home. Indeed it is. <laughs> And Anderson is very much a threat to run with 31 stolen bases. He's only been thrown out eight times. Brady's fourth in the league in stolen bases. Luis Polonia of California leads with 35. 
Pat Listash, the talented rookie of the Milwaukee Brewers, is second with 33, and Kenny Lofton of Cleveland with 32. Mike Devereaux fly to left his first time up. 1-0 Texas. The Orioles with Anderson at first and one out in the third. They pitch out on the first pitch to Devereaux, and it's ball one. Kind of hard to pitch out with a pitcher like Bobby Witt. We mentioned all his walks back in 1989. He led the American League in walks with 114. And if you fall behind, he fell behind Brady Anderson. Anderson got a hit. You don't like to pitch out with pitchers like Bobby Witt because uh, he has a tough time finding the strike zone. Strike on the inside corner. We saw that Bobby Witt is in the top 10 all time in strikeouts for nine innings. He's even higher on that list in walks for nine innings among those who have made at least 100 starts in Major League Baseball. Only Tommy Byrne walked more per nine. Two and one on Mike Devereaux. For those of you who don't remember Tommy Byrne, he was a left-hander with the Yankees, the Browns, the White Sox, and the Senators in the 1940s and 50s. There are a lot of managers that think that this is a good running count. I don't agree with that philosophy. I, I think this is a good offensive situation. And a lot of times if a runner runs, a hitter has a tendency to swing at a ball just off the plate to protect the runner. This is, uh, this is a situation where you want your guys to crank. But a lot of, run a lot of managers send their runners here. Including John Oates. Anderson on the move. The pitch with the strike. The throw to one hopper. Not in time. That is stolen base number 32 of the year for Brady Anderson. And Mike Devereaux sees that it's a slider. And he takes it. And Anderson stealing his 32nd base easily. He even had Fry come up with that ball, and Fry, the second baseman, was covering, not the shortstop Jeff Houston, but uh, Houston. But had he come up with the ball, there's no chance to get Anderson. The Orioles have stolen 52 bases as a team this year now, and that is two more than they stole all of last year. Devereaux pulled it. That won't move Anderson along. Houston, a low throw, dug out by Palmero. Nice play for the second out of the inning. Well, did he smother it or catch it? He had to have control. It was a good play by Palmero to take the ball to his chest and then come out with a bare hand. Check it out here. He smothered it, and then he brings it out with his bare hand to show first base umpire Tim Welke. Here's another look. That is close to trapping the ball against your chest. As a matter of fact, I saw some leakage there out of the heel of the glove. I think Raphael uh, went in with his bare hand and came out with it quickly enough to where Welke had to call him out. Close play. Indeed it was. Still 1-0 Texas in the bottom of the third, and the batter's Cal Ripken drew the only walk issued by Witt to this point in the first inning. Strike one at the knees. Witt did not issue a walk in his last outing on Monday at Milwaukee, over seven and a third innings, the longest outing of his career without issuing a walk, and only the fourth time in 175 career Major League starts that he did not issue at least one walk. Two of the four should hardly count along those lines because one of them was the start of an inning in two-thirds back in 1989 against Baltimore, the other three and two-thirds against Cleveland. So you're talking about quality starts in which 
He did not issue a walk. There are only two of those, and the other one was way back in 1986. One and one on Ripken. Two outs. Anderson at second. In the third. One nothing Texas. Off speed pitch. And Ripken bounced it right back to Bobby Witt who ends the inning. We played three at Oriole Park in Baltimore. One nothing Rangers. Uh, Rafael Palmero making a fine play on that scoop of the throw by Jeff Houston. The ball hit by Mike Devereaux. But watch when Devereaux passes Palmero. That's an in-between hop. And watch this right there. Now see, that's the wristband of Palmero. But right in that area is the ball. And he smothered that ball, but the glove was between his hand and the umpire. And I don't think Welke got a good view of it. Still one nothing in favor of Texas as we go to the fourth. Ruben Sierra, the leadoff batter, he was out on a fly ball to left back in the first. He'll be followed by Kevin Reimer and Juan Gonzalez against Rick Sutcliffe, who has retired four in a row. a strike a ball and a strike on Ruben Sierra remember Tom Kelly's remarks when Ruben Sierra hit the home run against Bob Tewksbury in the all-star game Tom was saying that Sierra kills these in-between pitchers meaning the guys who throw about 84 85 mile an hour now Sutcliffe throws about that speed about 83 85 but he makes hitters reach for the ball but if he throws the ball on the fat part of the plate look for Sierra to hit it hard because that type of speed is the, the guy that uh, Sierra hits very, very hard. The bat went flying. The ball went straight back to the screen. The bat went into the Oriole dugout. For those of you just joining us, we're at Oriole Park at Camden Yards in Baltimore, site of game three of this four-game series between the Rangers and the Orioles. And the Rangers lead one to nothing. Brian Downing started the ball game with a double. He was sacrificed to third and scored in a ground out by Rafael Palmiro. These two pitchers have seen batters reach base, but just that one run has come across. two now Sierra just a 223 lifetime hitter against Baltimore that's his lowest average against any American League team do hitters think that way at all Tim I know no as a hitter you go up there thinking I have had trouble or success in the past against this particular pitcher but does that apply to teams yeah, well, you know you've hit, you know generally that you hit some pitchers and some teams very well and some poorly, but you don't know specifically mm -hmm. what it is. You don't know that that is the worst, for instance. Ripken, the catch of the soft line drive from Sierra. Ruben now for his last 16. One out in the fourth, one nothing Texas. If, uh, for instance, you have a history of hitting a pitcher well, the one thing you try to overcome is the temptation to be over anxious. I mean, you can't wait wait to get to the ballpark. You've uh, hit a pitcher well over periods of years. Uh, there's no way he can get you out. And uh, you end up with an 0 for 4 on a day like that. And you can't understand it. Most of the time, it's because you're too anxious uh, to hit against him. And you start changing your batting style. And I would imagine the reverse is true as well. Uh-huh. Sutcliffe ahead of Reimer one strike. Rick walked Reimer to start the second. He also walked the trolley in the second. But he struck out the side in inning number two as well. Saw Reimer uh, swinging at that first curveball in the dirt from a from a hitting theory standpoint. 
what you try to do, generally speaking, as a hitter, is to work the pitcher to a count where you get a predictable pitch. That's a basic hitting mm -hmm. theory. Now, if that pitch is the first pitch, so be it. But the, the deeper you go in the count, the tougher it is to hit. 0-1, oh 0-2. And oh and Very difficult to hit with a count 0-2. Oh but if the pitcher goes ball one, ball two, ball three, now it becomes easier to hit because the pitches are more predictable. The one-two pitch. Fastball on the inside corner got him. Two outs in the fourth. That's four strikeouts this afternoon for Rick Sutcliffe. Now you think about now curveball in the dirt and then slider for a strike with the count one and two he pops the fastball inside to to freeze Kevin Reimer. So Rick has retired six in a row and the hitter is Juan Gonzalez who struck out swinging his first time up. Popped up straight back and onto our front porch. It's a big lawn, too. Yes. <laughs> as you might expect, that's the vantage point from our broadcast booth. And as you might expect, in this ballpark, it is a very comfortable booth in which to work with a good vantage point to the action for us. The same could not be said of all the other ballparks around Major League Baseball. But the good folks across America don't want to hear us whine about the hazards and problems of our job but maybe they do <laughs> well a couple do <laughs> maybe your family that's about <laughs> that's it about it <laughs> and they've heard it already <laughs> <laughs> it's redundant to them so <laughs> the 0-2 pitch off the end of the bat and caught again by bill ripton one two three go the rangers after three and a half one nothing texas Major League Baseball. Today's game is brought to you by Bud Dry. Dry brewed so it drinks light yet satisfies completely. Pringles, so fresh, once you pop, you can't stop. And by Toyota, reminding you to always buckle up. Do it for those who love you. The Rangers scored one run in the top of the first, and to this point, that run still stands alone. On just one Texas hit, a double to start the ball game by Brian Downing. Bobby Witt, as is often the case, has had to work through the first three innings he has yet to allow a run but he's already thrown 48 pitches and Toby Harris told us yesterday that he thinks after about 100 to 110 pitches ordinarily it is time to get Bobby Witt out of the ball game we'll keep our eye on that pitch count for Bobby Witt this afternoon he's looking at the middle third of the Baltimore order here in the fourth Glenn Davis extended his hit streak to nine games with a single to left in the first inning. He'll be followed by Randy Milligan and Joe Orsolak. Ball one outside to Davis. Davis bothered last year by a very serious neck injury. This year a muscle problem along the left side of his rib cage kept him out of 25 games earlier in the season he has only played one game at first base this year and that was on opening day but he's been taking ground balls and he hopes that within the next couple of days he will be able to play again in the field sometimes pain and injuries can make you think that you have to change your approach to hitting sometimes you're out for so long a period of time had you forgot how you did it initially. Ball three, again, with deep into account, three and one with Davis. pitch outside corner around the knees the count is full one says it has been very frustrating to be a member of the Oriole Ball Club and be able to do so little over the last year and a half knowing with his track record that he could contribute were he healthy but being unable to because of his physical problems 
of the 258 games that he's could that he could have played since joining Baltimore, he's played only 94. Mm. Told us yesterday it's one year remaining on his contract with the Orioles. And that's ball four high. Bobby Witt has issued a second walk, and we send it to Pat O'Brien. All right, Sean, thank you. Top of the fourth in Boston, Minnesota at Boston. Danny Darwin fans Kirby Puckett. Darwin has a perfect game going. He's retired 15 in a row. No score in the fifth. Back to the max. <laughs> wow. Whew. Thank you, Pat. Danny Darwin making just his second start of the year for Boston. He had been in the bullpen all year, but Butch Hobson put him into the rotation Monday night in Kansas City when Mike Gardner was sent down to the minors. Problem hasn't been pitching for the Red Sox. It has been hitting. They were one hit twice this week, including last night by Scott Erickson and earlier in the week by Hippolito Pachardo of Kansas City. Randy Milligan, the batter. That's right back to Witt. To Houston. And they turn the double play. 1-6-3, but not without an anxious moment around second base. And Witt walks over to say something to Jeff Houston, who made a nice play to feel that throw that was behind him. Yeah. Just like a quarterback leads an outside receiver, a pitcher throwing the second base tries to lead a shortstop. Instead, Bobby Witt, we mentioned control problems, throws it to where Houston was instead of where he was going to be. And Jeff makes a nice play to complete the double play. Houston very steady, both at second base, where he has never committed an error in parts of five seasons in Major League Baseball and also at shortstop. And Toby Harris said when he took over this ball club that the number one priority was to shore up the defense. The Rangers have committed more errors than any team in the American League. Toby tried a rookie Donald Harris in center field for a while. He's an outstanding defensive player, but he had a tough time hitting. Harris has gone back to the minors. He's used Houston in a platoon at short with Thon and he went to Jeff Fry to solidify second base defensively. The ball high and Witt has fallen behind Joe Orsalak. Three balls and no strikes. Bobby Valentine, the former Texas Ranger manager, had managed the Rangers since the mid-1984 season. He was fired on July 9th and the Rangers under Toby Hara are six and seven. That's ball four. It looked like a pretty good pitch, but ruled the ball. And Orsalak draws the second walk of the inning. First one erased on the double play ball. Three walks in all issued by Bobby Witt. The American League used to be a predominantly high ball league. Now, see, that's a, that's a pitch right above the belt. And umpires just simply do not call that pitch a strike anymore. Mm. It should be a strike. Certainly it should. Right below the letters to the top of the knees. That's generally the strike zone. And even though you remember the uh, American League umpires used to wear those big balloons on the outside, the balloon protectors, and they used to have to stand behind the catcher. They couldn't see the low pitch very well. But they have more or less taken the National League umpire stance now, working the gaps. You can see a home plate umpire, Dan Morrison, and watch how he works the gap between the catcher and the pitcher right in that area right there. And that gives him a much better look at the low pitch. And that's another pitch. Yeah. That could have been a strike. I mean, that ball's belt high. One ball and one strike on Leo Gomez. I think uh, a lot of a lot of hitters and a lot of pitchers, uh, not too many hitters complain about it because more balls are being called on them. But a lot of pitchers complain. But the one thing that uh, compensates for that and balances things out is I think the umpires have widened the strike zone. Mm -hmm. I think pitchers are getting, especially the outside part, I think they're getting the outside corners on a more consistent basis. But I think that's stretching it in the wrong direction, Tim, because that ball around the belt, at least the hitter has a chance to do something with it. But a pitch off the plate outside, you're asking him to that's reach right. across the plate. And if he does get a bat on it, he probably isn't going to be able to do much with it. That's right. That's, the, that's off the fat part of the bat. Mm -hmm. So the hitters would have less of a complaint if they call the high pitch and not the pitch off the plate away or in that uh, black area. The black of the plate is that little inch uh, thing, little inch strip that runs around the plate. 
and pitchers say that was on the black. You hear a lot of hitters say that ball was on the black. Technically, it's not a strike because the black is not part of the plate over which a pitcher has to throw to get a strike. Hmm. See right there, now technically the strike zone should be about like that, to the top of the knees to right below the le letters. And you see that ball right in that uh, spot just above the belt, that ball's a strike. But more and more in baseball, you see that umpires are calling it ball. Petrali, Palmer, and Witt by the dugout. It's Petrali, I believe, yes, the catcher who made the catch to end the inning. He held on despite the contact from behind by Dean Palmer. After four in Baltimore, still 1-0, Rangers. Sean McDonough with Tim McCarver in Baltimore where the Rangers lead 1-0 after four innings. The bottom third of the Texas order coming up, Dean Palmer. Gino Petrali and Jeff Fry against Rick Sutcliffe, who has set down seven in a row. Sutcliffe has only allowed the one hit, the leadoff double to start the game by Brian Downey. Dean Palmer struck out his first time up, one of four strikeouts registered by Sutcliffe. Sutcliffe is averaging just over four strikeouts per nine innings this year at 4.1 per nine. Four already today, so perhaps what John Oates said before the ball game it is true that the Rangers will help them out by swinging at some balls out of the strike zone. They are a free swinging ball club. And talking about what we said in the earlier innings, uh, Rick Sutcliffe gets ahead with strikes and gets them out with balls. And so far, he's done a good job of that, but he has been bested by Bobby Witt. Popped out of play, first base side, two and two on Dean Palmer. again. Rick Sutcliffe used to be a power pitcher. We mentioned he was rookie of the year for the Dodgers back in 1979. A Cy Young Award winner in 1984 when he was traded to the Chicago Cubs. He was 16 and won that year with the Cubs. But I think Rick is intelligent enough to go from a power pitcher to a contact pitcher and do it successfully. Palmer's making contact and following them away, and it's still two and two. Contact pitcher uh, really defined in baseball as a pitcher that puts the ball in play on his terms for the most part. And the Orioles took a bit of a chance on Rick Sutcliffe when they signed him as a free agent back in December. He's had a history of injury trouble the last couple of years. But John Oates was very familiar with Sutcliffe when he was the rookie of the year in 1979. John Oates was a catcher, teammate of Sutcliffe on the Dodgers. And Oates was a coach with the Cubs in 84 when Sutcliffe won the Cy Young Award there. Gomez throws him out. So when Sutcliffe was available in the offseason, John Oates gave a strong recommendation to general manager Roland Heeman. Sutcliffe said once he walked into this park and got a look at it, he knew but this park, along with John Oates, were two big reasons why he was ready to sign that very day. I would imagine this would, this ballpark would sell a lot of uh, mm -hmm. prospective free agents. Gino Petrali walked his first time up. Rangers batting with a 1-0 lead in the fifth. One out of the base is empty. Ranger fans will remember that at the start of his career, Gino Petrali was a switch hitter. He gave up switch hitting and hit exclusively from the left side starting in August of 1987 until last night when he came up with the bases loaded and hit right-handed against Arthur Rhodes. He hit once earlier in the ball game left-handed, had a tough time picking up the ball, so he tried to bat right-handed but struck out. That's a heck of a time to experiment, though, with the bases <laughs> loaded. You do that stuff in spring training. <laughs> Not in July. One and two. Trolley 
released back in 1986 and was out of baseball for about a month until the Rangers called him. He was working loading soft drinks onto trucks out in Sacramento, California. He strikes out. Todd looking at the fastball from Sutcliffe for the second out of the fifth inning. Five strikeouts for Sutcliffe, and he has retired nine in a row. Jeff Fry, the batter, he was called out on strikes to end the second. That was the inning in which Sutcliffe struck out the side. Ball one. Tim mentioned earlier, Fry, the fifth different player to start at second base for Texas this year. That's the highest total of second baseman of any team in the American League. Al Newman has seen the most action at second base. 42 starts. Jeff Houston, 33. Fry, 12. Julio Franco has only started nine games, and Monty Ferris, three. Well, that pales in comparison to the 22 pitchers that the Rangers have used. Also the most in the majors. Mm -hmm. Fry popped up the bunt right to Sutcliffe. One, two, three, go the Rangers. Halfway through the ball game, a pitcher's duel. One nothing, Texas. Bonnie Witt has shut out the Orioles through four innings, but he's already thrown 63 pitches. Yesterday, we asked Toby Hera about Bobby Witt's pitch count. If it was up to Bobby Witt, he'd like to throw 130 pitches, but myself, uh, Bobby Witt's the type of guy that uh, takes a lot of effort for him to throw a baseball. And over the course of the year, I believe that it, as the season goes along, he loses a little bit. And I don't believe you can let him pitch too many pitches over 115, 120 pitches. Hey, if I'm a pitcher, that, that'd be fine if you have a good bullpen, but the Rangers' bullpen, the second-worst ERA in the American League, only Seattle is worse. So if you're going to give up, you know, a winning effort to a bullpen that can maintain a lead for the most part, mm -hmm. well, that's one thing, but if you pitch a good ball game and have the bullpen consistently give up the lead, then I'm going to say something as a pitcher. Uh -huh. I'll tell you that. I don't care how many pitches I've thrown. One and one the count is Witt. Works to Bill Ripken. Bounce back to the mound his first time up. That's past the mound. Jeff Fry throws him out. Let's check in again with Pat O'Brien. All right, Sean, thank you. Some excitement at Fenway building. Danny Darwin has retired 18 in a row now. A perfect game through six. The Red Sox only have one hit themselves. No score. Bottom of the six. Back to Sean and Tim. The way the Red Sox have been going, you would have guessed that Danny Darwin was pitching to his own team. Only one hit yesterday against Scott Erickson, one hit early in the week against Hippolito Pichardo, only one hit today. You talk about how if you were a pitcher for Texas and you were frustrated by the bullpen's ability to protect the lead, I would imagine the same is true of Boston Red Sox pitchers and the inability of their teammates to score runs for them. Mm -hmm. The Mets pitchers have experienced the same thing this year. Teams that have struggled to score a lot of runs but have pitched well. The Cubs, another example of that. Of course, you as a pitcher have no control over their scoring runs. You do have control over staying in the game. Mm -hmm. Here, if I've got a one one nothing lead after six or seven innings, I'm a, they're going to have to get a crane to grab that ball out of my hand. Leo Gomez, rather uh, Jeff Tackett, fouled it at the plate. Taggett struck out swinging his first time up. As a catcher, how frequently were you inclined to give your opinion at the mound with the manager about whether or not the pitcher should stay in the ball game? Well, that, that's a very difficult thing to do because you're always trying to build up the confidence uh, as a catcher uh, between you and the pitcher. And uh, the manager comes out and asks you how he's throwing. What are you going to say? He stinks. Uh, Get him out of terrible. Here. Take him out. <laughs> I mean, what kind of confidence builder is that? 
You make a lot of friends, but then you get to, he stinks, but the guy in the bullpen's worse. <laughs> <laughs> so by default, he stays in. <laughs> That's right. So I'd say choosing the lesser of the two evils, leave this guy in there. Bobby Witt certainly does not stink. He's pitching a beautiful ball game this afternoon. He's allowed only two hits, and that strikeout is his second of the afternoon. Both have come at the expense of Jeff Tackett. Two outs in the fifth, one nothing Texas. And the batter is Brady Anderson, who's one for two. He singled through the glove of Jeff Fry, the second baseman, to extend his hitting streak to seven games in the third. The good managers don't put you in a spot like that. Mm -hmm. They would never, ever uh, uh, put a catcher on the spot and ask him how he's uh, throwing. He may ask you in the dugout away from, uh, away from the pitcher where you're more inclined to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> The bad manager might ask so he could say to the media after the ball game, well, I asked the yeah, catcher. Oh, and he sure. Said, Take right. him out of there. Yeah, blame me. Right. Blame the catcher. The 1-1 one -one to Anderson is just outside. The Orioles have had a runner in every inning at least one against Bobby Witt except the second. Trying to work his second perfect inning of the afternoon here in the fifth, having retired the first two, but he's fallen behind Brady Anderson, three and one. Ball four. So again, the Orioles have a base runner on the fourth walk thrown by Bobby Witt. Coming up tomorrow on CBS Sports, it's the 24th annual Die Hard 500. Live from the Talladega Super Speedway in Talladega, Alabama. That's tomorrow at 1 Eastern Time here on CBS. Mike Devereaux has flied to left and bounced to short. He's up with two outs and Anderson at first in the bottom of the fifth, one nothing Texas. Anderson stole his 32nd base of the year after singling in the third. Devereaux sends it straight back for strike one. Mike Devereaux, one of three brothers that attended Arizona State. He was a sprint champion in high school out of Wyoming. Not too many major league players coming out of Wyoming. Mm. One that comes to mind, Greg Brock, who went to the University of Wyoming. Dan Spilner, a pitcher. Anderson was running, and the pitch got by Petrelli. Brady didn't know it, and he went sliding into second base. That's his second stolen base of the ball game and 33rd of the year. You folks may not know that uh, if the runner is in motion and the catcher has the ball go behind him, it is a stolen base in lieu of a wild pitch. But had Anderson not been running, it would have been indeed a wild pitch. Mm -hmm. But because he was in motion, the assumption is that the catcher wouldn't throw him out anyway. You can't assume that the throw will be there. So it's a stolen base instead of a wild pitch. The fans. Trying to spur on the Orioles. They've had little to cheer about this afternoon, but now Baltimore has the tying run in scoring position. With two outs in the fifth. Witt issued a two-out walk in the first and got away with it. He issued a two-out walk in the fourth and dodged that bullet. Sooner or later, he's going to get hurt by the two-out walk. Two and one on Devereaux. Devereaux will be followed by Cal Ripken Jr. <laughs> the 
in the air and left center not very deep Reimer makes the catch and that ends the inning it's one nothing Texas and will return to Oriole Park at Camden Yards after this message and a Only three hits combined between these two teams after five innings. We haven't had a hit from either team since Brady Anderson singled in the Baltimore third. Rick Sutcliffe facing the top of the order and Brian Downing. Downing has the only hit off Sutcliffe. A double to start the ball game. He was sacrificed to third by Jeff Houston and scored on a ground out by Rafael Palmero. It seemed a bit odd with a slugging Texas lineup to play for one run in the first inning. However, comma, perhaps Toby Hara knew what kind of a game this was going to be. Ten in a row retired by Sutcliffe. Toby Hara's last batter to reach base was Gino Petrali, who walked with two outs in the second. Until now, Ryan Downing has both Texas hits. Take you around the horn in the American League. Robin Yount closing in on 3,000 hits. Only needs 34 to become the 17th player in Major League history to have 3,000 hits. What a remarkable career he's had. Elsewhere, New York way, Danny Tartable has opened things up in July. Eight home runs in July leads the Major Leagues. So the Yankees waited uh, for about a month and a half. Tartable starting the early part of the season on the disabled list. Wife giving birth to a baby. Lost some time there. Houston's bunt just did roll foul. It was running out of gas just as it crossed the line in a foul territory. At the very mention of Danny Tartable picking up steam, this ball runs out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> trickling foul. <laughs> Nothing much uh, that Gomez or Tackett could do with it, so you let balls like that roll foul and hope that it does the spin of the ball carrying that ball into foul territory. But one would suspect another bun here. Mm -hmm. Houston sacrificed successfully to set up the run back in the first. He fly to right in the third. He swings away, and that's a base hit. <laughs> Sounded like a broken bat. Downing to second on the play. So after having just one hit through the first five innings, the Rangers have back-to-back -back hits to start the sixth. When you say one would suspect a sacrifice, you protect yourself as a broadcaster. <laughs> <laughs> then when he swings away, you see you've insulated yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Houston rifles one in the left field. So Toby Hara, conservative in the first inning, playing more adventurous uh, Lee here in the sixth inning. Good hitting by Jeff Houston. And Toby Hara is managing for his future. He was given a contract just through the end of this 1992 season, and the understanding basically was that the Rangers played well and got back into things in the West. He would come back next year. If not, he won't be back. I asked Toby about that yesterday, and he said he had no problem with that. It doesn't put any more pressure on him. Toby says that's the way it should be. If this team doesn't win, I shouldn't come back. Yeah, but that's still an awfully tough job to mm -hmm. be an interim manager. Kind of like late-inning defense. Rafael Palmero, the batter, one ball to count. Changeup was very high. 2 and 0. Oh. What I what I have found uh, Sean as you look at the Orioles bullpen. Pat Clements left the lefty and Allen Mills the right-hander. What I have found with interim managers is that what they initially try to do is the exact opposite of what they're That's a bullet to right center field toward the wall and off the wall on a hop. It bounced off the wall on a hop, not touched by a fan. It did not bounce over on the rubberized warning track and two-run score. That's a break for Texas. Last night when balls bounced on that warning track, they were bouncing up into the stands. If that had happened, only one run would have scored, but that one stayed in the park, a double to drive in two by Paul Merrill. He's driven in all three Texas runs, and it's 3-0 Rangers. Paul Merrill is now 5-for-8 against Rick Sutcliffe this year he has two home runs now a double 
two RBIs and the Rangers catching a break because that ball bounced close to the fence short hopping the fence and Palmero with a double is 23rd checked at his 18th double of the year Ruben Sierra the fourth batter of the inning the first three have all come away with a hit after the Rangers were held to just one hit through five Sutcliffe could be tiring bear in mind he's pitching on three days rest Sierra with a pop-up it will be close but back into the seats about five or six rows deep getting back to that point about an interim manager the one thing that interim managers do is they do the exact reverse of the guy that they're replacing and what they have done a lot of times it, it is very natural to do that if uh, the manager that there that preceded them uh, hit and run hits and runs a lot or hits and ran a lot mm -hmm. then uh, they take the the other way if he bunted too much then they have a tendency not to bunt as much if they use the bullpen too much then he has a tendency to go with the starting pitching right. staff more well that would be human nature because sure. obviously that interim manager feels ownership and management fired the manager because they didn't like what he was doing right so I have to do things differently Randy Milligan wins the race to the base to retire Sierra for the first out of the inning Paul Merrill the third out two runs in here in the sixth the Rangers lead three nothing and the fifth batter of the inning is Kevin Reimer he has walked and struck out got to play your infield in don't you in this situation with one out Ripken's back it's short you got to play in here Got a man on third and a three run uh, deficit I guess uh, what they're going to do is walk mm -hmm. Reimer to get to Gonzalez and then play him halfway uh, play for the double play There's Juan Gonzalez, who's 0 for 2 this afternoon. He'll bat with runners at first and third and one out. John Oates said before the game, it doesn't really do much good to bring in a lefty to face Kevin Reimer. There are some potent bats on the Texas bench. That is particularly true when Brian Downing is not in the game. Downing is today. He'd be a likely candidate to pinch hit against the lefty were he not in the starting lineup. And that is the third walk thrown by Sutcliffe, the first intentional walk. Here's Juan Gonzalez, who struck out swinging on a pitch well out of the strike zone in the second. He lined two second in the fourth. It's funny about an intentional walk in this situation. You walk the runner to have the hitter hit the ball hard enough to get a double play. <laughs> it's a strange game in that respect. Indeed it is. Would you agree that the infield is playing far enough back that they really have no option to go to the plate. They have to try to turn two and with Gonzalez running they hope that's they hope that's what they'll be able to do. Unless the balls hit the third if you have a high chopper hit the third then he does have the option mm -hmm. to come home but not the middle infielders. Once hit sharply, foul past third. A ball and a strike on Juan Gonzalez. Juan is four for his last 39. That might have played a part in Johnny Oates' decision to pitch around Reimer to get to Gonzalez. One one bounced foul Dave Oliver the third base coach thought about making a play and then thought better of it there was a change in the coaching staff Toby Hara brought Orlando Gomez from the first base box into the dugout to be a dugout coach to help him communicate with the Rangers Latin players Perry Hill the minor league instructor was taken out of that role and named the first base coach off the end of the bat, but over the head of Ripken. A base hit to bring in another run. Palmero scores to make it four to nothing. Reimer took second on the play, and the RBI for Gonzalez is his 60th of the year. Looked like a slider out over the plate, actually off the plate. And Juan Gonzalez, who had 102 RBIs last year, drives in his 60th to give Texas a 4-0 lead. That ball way outside, and 
Gonzalez with great plate coverage hits it off the end of the bat. So Sutcliffe working on three days rest. Breeze through five, but labored here in the sixth. Top of the seventh at Fenway, Boston's Danny Darwin bidding for a no-hitter. His perfect game ended when he walked the leadoff man in the seventh. There's Dick Stockton and Jim Cott. Red Sox leading 1-0. Kirby Puckett facing Danny Darwin, who was not allowed a base hit. There's a pitch out. The Red Sox thought that Mac Mike might be running, and he was not, and the count is 1-0 to Kirby Puckett. Minnesota Twins trail the Red Sox 1-0. They scored a run on an infield hit in the bottom of the sixth inning. Danny Darwin has not allowed a base hit. He retired the first 18 batters before Shane Mack threw a walk to lead off the seventh inning to end his perfect game. And Puckett, right on that fastball, fouls it back, and it's one and one to Kirby. Darwin now with the base runner. Garden Hire looking into Tom Kelly to relay the sign. But Darwin's using that slide step, you know, where you barely pick your foot up. And boy, the kind of rhythm that he's been in, that can be a little bit disruptive right now. More concern with the base runner than the league's best hitter in the batter's box. So not only has that aspect affected his rhythm, but the fact that he had to wait in the dugout a long time as the Red Sox scored their one run and sent seven men to the plate last inning. See how Darwin responds to the rhythm change. One and one to Puckett, spending a lot of time, as Jim mentioned, watching Mac over at first base. has been a relief pitcher virtually the, this entire season. In fact, last Monday night was his first start of the year after 36 relief appearances. One and one the count to Kirby Puckett. There goes Mack, and the pitch is fouled back. So the hit and run was on. And Mack will have to come back to first, and the count is one and two to Puckett. It's been a game dominated by the pitchers, although Willie Banks has walked seven batters. Darwin has the no-hitter, has struck out five. And Pena has the lone RBI with an infield hit in the bottom of the sixth. We're in the top of the seventh. One ball and two strikes to Kirby. Top hitter in the league. And the big offensive threat. Red Sox have had a lot of trouble scoring runs this season, but not the Minnesota Twins. So Darwin has held the best hitting team in the American League hitless into the seventh. That'll go over the roof off to the right side, and it's still one and two. A couple of factors coming into play right now. Remarkable performance by Danny Darwin, but not having gone this long, you know a little bit of sting is coming off that fastball and slider, and then you go against a lineup like this the third time through, chances to be, begin to increase for guys like Puckett to be on time. Mack has the lead. Here's the one-two pitch. The runner doesn't go, and there's a looper in the center field. That just may drop, and it will for a base hit. The throw to third base. Shane Mack dives in safely. Puckett holds it first, and the Minnesota Twins get their first base hit of the game. On a single to center field by Kirby Puckett and Minnesota now with runners at first and third and one out. And Mack is the tying run at third. And a hand for Danny Darwin. And as they applaud Danny Darwin, let's take you back to Camden, Sean McDonough, and Tim McCarver, Texas and Baltimore. Four to nothing, top of the six, fellas. <laughs> 